Gabriel Heater. You're about to hear a remarkable story and witness a true story of a master criminal. Now, frankly, I'm worried about one thing. Because we want you to get the whole true story, I'm afraid some of you might mistakenly regard him as a kind of hero, when as a matter of fact, he's only a brutal, vicious criminal. Oh, he was shrewd, all right. Shrewd enough even to outsmart himself. But in the end, he was caught and he had to pay. And that man's supreme reward was life in prison. Now, watching it unfold, I realized how a man can begin by fooling himself. Time he begins to believe, he can outsmart and fool everybody. But he winds up realizing he only fooled himself. Realizing he's society's enemy and his own worst bitter enemy. And I know when it's over, you'll agree. There's nothing admirable or decent and certainly nothing heroic about him at all. And I know you'll take off your hat to the brave men, the authorities, whose lives are dedicated to protect us and help our children avoid the same pitfalls which brought this man to his ruin. Oregon, like the rest of the nation, has felt the impact of prison riots and jailbreaks in recent years. But because of the successful efforts of Governor Paul Patterson and Warden Clarence Gladden, the citizens of Oregon today no longer live in fear of escapes and disturbances on the part of prisoners. Throughout our nation, the construction of new buildings and the improvement of penal institutions in general have not kept pace with our increasing population. As a result, bad living conditions and crowded cell blocks sometimes have incited the inmates to attempt escapes. It was at the Oregon State Prison that the most unique jailbreaks in modern penal history took place. The escapes were made by John Omar Pinson, once public enemy number four. It was Pinson's daring actions that finally aroused the conscientious officials and citizens of Oregon to improve conditions at the state prison. The true account of Pinson's escapes is a vicious and ruthless one. And Gangbusters presents it to you now in the hope that public attention throughout the nation will be focused on our penal institutions. I'm Detective Lieutenant Walsh, your host for this Gangbusters case. These are some of the tools of our trade. From the size of this collection, you might think it was the equipment for our entire department, but you'd be wrong. This arsenal was carried by one man, the most interesting and dangerous criminal I've met in 20 years of police work. The case began October 12, 4 p.m. I was making a routine check of motor vehicles near the apartment at 1276 Jones Avenue, an apartment then occupied by William Moore. Pardon me. Yes? Is this your car? Oh, yes. Why? Do you have a license? Of course I do. May I see it, please? What are you, a police officer? Detective. Oh. What's wrong? Some sort of trouble? There could be plenty of trouble. What's your name? William Morse. May I see that license, please? Certainly. Well, what do you know? 
This man must be wanted for something more than just stealing cars. Brother, what a trick. October 12, 8.26 p.m. We booked him under the name of William Morse. The suspect denied any knowledge of the stolen car he'd been driving and maintained that he was William Morse, a scientist. You should be more careful with that. It might be loaded. It was. Where did you get them? I've never seen them before. Somebody must have placed them in my car when I wasn't looking. Then why did you try to shoot me? Frankly, I didn't believe you were a police officer. You look more like a stick-up artist. With all these hold-ups lately, huh? mm. I suppose you thought this was a long stem petunia. Of course not. Petunias have short stems. Where were you going with it? To see a girl. What's the name? Well, I don't know. I haven't met her yet. And um, I suppose you were going to read to her out of this book, The Science of Explosives. Don't be preposterous. You say you're a scientist. What does this mean? If the basicity? The basicity of the acid is known. The true molecular weight is equal to the apparent molecular weight multiplied by the basicity. You don't read it too well. To know the basicity means to know the number of hydrogen atoms that can be replaced. What was your name again? William Morse. William Morse. <laughs> good news. Very good news. It says the fingerprints of William Morse are identical in every swirl with those of John Omar Pinson, public enemy number four, graduate of Iowa State Penitentiary, Missouri State, and numerous visits to Walla Walla. Hmm. The entrance exams at Walla Walla aren't too rigid. It's easy to get in. It would take me a half hour to recite a list of your crimes. But if you'd like a refresher course... No, thanks. You'll be in for life this time, Pinson. I doubt that. It's a tough place, Oregon State Penn. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I'll tame it. On November 16, we remanded John Omar Pinson to the custody of Oregon State, where he was placed in their penitentiary. He was vicious, cunning, and ruthless. Within six months, he had made good his brag. He was the king of the yard. He gathered around him the toughest criminals of the lot. Larry O'Gelby, number 18354, killer of Deputy Al Bowie after a holdup at Hood River. Number 7986, Louis Pfeff, who with his partner, number 7166, Mike Denicky, had a Tommy gun and some pistols stashed away somewhere outside the prison. Number 15696, Slug Bennett, who was to play such an important role in Pinson's life. So it's going to be a break, a crash up. If everything goes... Grandmother wanted me to sing in the church choir. Sunday morning, I donned my Buster Brown collar and I sang. Sang beautifully. I can see it now. Grandmother with the tears streaming down her face. What the... Lousy Scrooge. Pinch his little pink cheeks. That was a life ride, knife. Okay, okay, when's the big break? It's going to be entirely different. Different from any break ever tried. This time, there won't be any dissension or argument or misunderstanding, because this time, I'm going to make it alone. <laughs> what do you mean? Oh, it has to be that way. There's too much unrest around here. The whole yard's on its toes. But once I'm out, I'll come back for you. Better promise. That's a promise. Mr. Pinson? Huh? Mr. Pinson, my name's Long. Wayne Long. Long, you're overdue, Peter. Oh, please, Mr. Pinson, listen to me. 
I'm in for five years for burglary. And when I heard you were here, I decided to meet you. Why? Because I want to study under you. You're the best man in the country in your field. Sit down. <laughs> Goodbye, baby. <laughs> what did you do, Sonny? I got caught robbing a grocery store. Gracious. I've been in reform school, too. <laughs> I'd just like to stay near you and have you teach me a few things. You're a punk, a two-bit gutless punk. You have no sense. You pull a two-bit job and take the same rap you'd get if you'd been after a million. Punks like this are all the same. They're brainless. They never get smart. But I want to learn. If you'll just let me hang around you, I'll do whatever you say. Run your errands. I'll steal cigarettes for you. Cigarettes? Well, let's try it. Show us how you lift a cigarette. All right. Over there. That fellow against the wall. He's deaf, half paralyzed, and sound asleep. Now, you go over there and clean him for me. Bring back all his tobacco. Sure. <laughs> Me on the side. I, I gotta see the doctor. Yeah, ask him to put you in the nursery. I'm sorry, Pinson. I'll do better next time. You can have my cigarettes. <laughs> Cigarette box? Yeah. yeah. Okay, Pinson. How about your break? I want to get assigned to the flax mill so I can boys. To do that, I've got to be on good behavior. That means I have to be clean. <laughs> if I want that used on anyone, you're going to have to do it. Well, boys, I've turned over a new leaf. I've repented. Hallelujah. March 3rd. Pinson, because of his good behavior, was allowed to work in the flax mill. He was there six weeks, when Tuesday, April 16th.
So John Omar Pinson made the first of his successful jailbreaks. And on April 24, eight days after his dramatic escape, the dapper, smooth-talking, but vicious criminal was getting ready to carry on business as usual. Lovely day. Beauty. Traveling? Uh, yes, I'm just passing through. It's a nice little town you have here. Glad you like it. Well, good luck. We meet again. Yeah. Anything wrong? No, no. Here, let me help you. Oh, thanks. Uh, if you'll dig in my pocket, I'll hold this. I need the keys. Oh, sure. What's in the bag? Fishing tackle. My rod's in the car. Yeah, like to fish, huh? I sure do. Have ever since I was a kid. But I take advantage of this vacation of mine. Maybe not a few trout. Trout? Uh-uh. It isn't trout season. Oh, well, being out of state, I guess I got mixed up on my dates. I have my keys, please. Sure. Thanks. That's a mighty bulky rod. Uh, yeah, it uh, holds a mighty bulky fish. When it dropped, it didn't sound like a fishing rod. Really? I didn't notice that. Well, you have to let me worry about it. Thanks a lot for your help. You'll have to excuse me now. I, uh, I'm a little late. And may I see your fishing license? I don't have one yet. But I'll get one before I start fishing. Mister, your story doesn't hold water. I think I'd better take a look at your fishing equipment. I told you with a rock. One twenty, less than twenty minutes after the killing of Officer Rondo, the alarm went out. Officer Rondo was well liked, left a wife and two small children. Within minutes, police officers, both on and off duty, were after the killer. Roadblocks were thrown up at strategic points leading out of the city and into the Oregon hills. All vehicles were stopped, and police officers even boarded buses to see if Pinson was among the passengers. The authorities were taking no chances on letting this man break into the clear. But there were times when Pinson was pretty good at outguessing us, and this was one of them. He anticipated the fact that police barriers would be set up, and he spotted our roadblock. From his vantage point, Pinson studied the situation quickly. He was not just an ordinary fugitive from the law. This man was very clever, and he was just as daring as he was clever. Pinson knew the road was blocked ahead and that he was being pursued from behind. He had to make a fast decision on the spot, and he made it.
Looks like we'll give him this round. Yeah, but he still hasn't cleared the area. Unit 12 to W2680, over. Come in, Unit 12. Pinson just crashed our roadblock, heading east on U.S. Highway 180. Alert all units. Unit 12, over and out. Well, what do we do now, Coach? Change that tire and capture Pinson, in that order. Or we'll both be turning our suits in. He'll ditch that car. Maybe we ought to double up on the freight yards. I don't know. Not with Pinson. That man's an egoist. He's clever, sometimes even brilliant. If we closed up the freight yards, he'd go out of town on a pullman. With our men checking on everybody that buys a ticket? And that, Mr. Fuller, is our next stop. Pinson had broken through our roadblock. A police plane kept him under observation and spotted the direction in which he was speeding. Next time, take the bus. October 26, 11 a.m. Pinson was returned to the Oregon State Penitentiary, where special guards were assigned to watch him. For months, he was on good behavior in the yard. Beat it, punk. But go over there and pull a knife or something. What for? Make sure the guards are watching you instead of us. Go on. back to spring you boys, so this time I'm going to take you with me. Special guards watching you? Hmm. There won't be any special guards. We're all going on good behavior so we can get assigned to the motor pool. What's the stooge? Long sure sucker for you, Pinson. Yeah. Now, we've only got a minute, so here goes. We set this up for the 20th of February at 2 in the afternoon. February 20. One minute before the deadline for the big mass escape. battle which ensued, John Omar Pinson took no part in the fighting. He remained aloof, waiting for the opportune moment.
Now move back toward the door of the machine shop. Hands behind your back. Move! And you guards, slug the first man that gets out of line. Bennett, move! Got him! Terrible. Can't understand why they tried it. I suppose you had nothing to do with this, huh? Of course not. Absolutely nothing. Have you ever been in deep solitary confinement here? No. It's a little cell deep in the ground. Its walls and ceiling and floor are three foot thick. It has an eight by ten inch window. And it's real dark and real quiet. There's no table, no chairs, no anything. And you get food twice a day. Mostly water and crackers. And it wouldn't surprise me that you're going to spend the next year there. Take him away. Wait a minute. I'll wipe that smile off of your face. Number 41867, Wayne Long, a young convict, worshipped Pinson. After repeated rebuffs, he saw a way to gain the confidence and favor of his idol. Through good behavior, he managed to get himself transferred into the prison bakery. Months of solitary had made Pinson aware of the never-changing pattern employed by the guards. For three months, night and day, when the guard took his four steps away from the cell, Pinson saw it. When he took his four steps back, out came the saw blade. One second of wrong timing, and he'd be caught. July 18, 5.30 at night, the bolt was cut. Pinson rubbed black from his shoes to make a mustache. He used pieces of his shirt tail to change the contours of his face. He was expecting the guard any second. Would the daring plan work? Can't you screws leave a guy alone? Shut up. Pinson, I've got the keys. Pinson. Get over there or I'll stick a knife in you. Pinson, let me go with you. I'm the guy who smuggled you the saw blade. Shut up. But if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't have the keys. Well, as long as you get over there and sit down, act like nothing's happening or I'm going to kill you. <laughs> Come on, you've got to get 
the easy desert. There are lots of keys here. Benson, please. Screw. I think he's getting kind of suspicious. Maybe not. Maybe he's... I've got it. So you think you're sick, huh? Well, we'll find out in a hurry. Stick out your hands. I'll give you some mittens. If you're not sick, you're gonna find yourself in a lot of trouble. Kenson. All right, move. Just a minute. Oh, I'm from the hospital ward. This monkey seems to think he's sick. Of emergency, there's been a break at Oregon State Penitentiary. Two convicts, John Omar Pinson and Slug Bennett, have broken out. Block all highways leading from the city and leave your radios open. With Bennett wounded, Pinson had to get into town fast. He knew the best place to steal a car was in Lover's Lane, where the driver is usually off guard. Bennett badly needed medical treatment. But the two fugitives were afraid a doctor would ask questions about gunshot wounds. So they broke into a drugstore, where Pinson made use of his chemical knowledge. It's, it's not the lead that hurts so much, it's my jaw. I don't know what's the matter, but it's hurting awful. Well, I'll give you some salicylic acid and codeine. Help ease the pain. How do you know so much? My business to know things like that. Study up on it. 
Oh, way I'm prepared. My jaw. I wonder what it is. So as we get through here, we'll take that sporting goods shop next door. Should be easy enough. We can cut right through the wall. What, a thousand cops looking for us? Yeah. This will make you woozy for a while, but it's going to help the job. <laughs> the water. Oh. Yeah. That's all we need. Most drug stores have cats around. They keep the mice away. I gotta be black. Maybe he was better off in the pen. All this pain, scared, no place to go. Everybody wanting to kill you. You're gonna make it all right. As soon as we get some guns. <laughs> Maybe you, you got brains. How does a guy get in a fix like this? He don't sit down and plan this when he's born. No, I don't like things to act like this. It didn't have to be black. Relax, it's just superstition. Superstition can hurt you when it comes out of the end of a gun. Speaking of guns, we need something next door. Let's go. This powder hurts you quicker than booze. You there's no poison in that? Bennett, if I wanted to kill you, there are lots of easier ways. Come on. Yes, you were entirely right in calling me. Now, now, please keep quiet for just a minute, will you? What's going on? Yeah, somebody knocked the phone off the hook down at Herrick Sporting Goods. You hear anything? Mm -hmm. Just an occasional rattle. Sporting goods store. If it's Pinson and Bennett, that's a good place for them to get guns. You're right. Wake up Jim Herrick and get his keys. I'll meet you down at the corner. Right. Just the cat. He followed us through that hole we cut in the wall. I'm not like you, Pinson. You got ice water in your veins. I can't take it anymore. You're doing all right. Now let's get out to that car. Get him up. their search, Pinson and Bennett crashed their way toward freedom. Meanwhile, all local law enforcement agencies, including city police, sheriff's deputies, and motorcycle officers from the state police, converged upon the escape area and quickly dispersed according to their well-organized plan. The bloodhounds found the scent, just as promptly lost it near the river. The officers converged upon that spot. No. No, Dobkin just reported in. They're not over there either. Man, it's cold out in this wood. Anything? Not a thing. I'll keep the boys after it. I'll go back to headquarters and put out an all points bulletin. Right. <laughs> Although the search was intensified, no effort was made to cross the river, as it was unanimously believed that the fugitives were too badly wounded to swim the Columbia in flood time. Remember? Yeah. I saw a shovel. 
I'm leaning against the fence. You can't die, Vincent. You can't. I wouldn't know what to do. Get it. No, Benson. It's not too much to ask, is it? Do a little digging for a pal. You can't leave me, Benson. I wouldn't know what to do without you. Get, get the shovel. Bennett continued to suffer great pain, and without Pinson to give him medical treatments, the agony became so intense that he was compelled to go to a doctor, even at the risk of being captured. You see anything yet, Doc? I'm afraid so. Huh? I'm sorry, Mr. Smith. Your jaw. You have cancer. No. No. Fugitive from the law, alone, suffering from cancer, and without Pinson to help him, Bennett became his own judge. And his sentence was a pretty stiff one. Mrs. Wallace, across the hall, heard the shot at 7.15. At 7.20, Bennett was rushed to the hospital, where an emergency operation was performed by Dr. Hall. At 8.45... This is Lieutenant Walsh. I'd like to speak to Dr. Hall, please. Doctor, the hospital list flies to report on an attempted suicide. Any information for me? Well, I don't know who this man really is, but uh, I've been treating him under the name of Smith. Mm -hmm. uh, what brought it on? He has seven bullets in him, plus the one with which he tried to kill himself. Will he pull through? Well, he'll recover from the gunshots, all right, but uh, not from the cancer. It's too late. Thanks, Dr. Hall. I think we'd better come right over. Something hot? Hot and heavy. Seven slugs of lead. Only one of two men could carry a cargo like that. Pinson or Bennett. Let's roll. Under questioning, knowing that he was dying, Bennett talked freely and admitted his part in the escape, burglary, and subsequent gun battle. Finally, we made it to the Columbia River. He was on our heels. We was bleeding so badly, we didn't think we could make it. We got a log, kept our heads low, and finally swung it over to the other side. It was a nightmare. Where's Pinson? Dead. Dead? Yeah. I know. I buried him. I don't believe it. You know I'm dying. Why should I lie to you? I just can't believe that Pinson's dead. If anybody ever bore a charmed life, he did. How can we be sure? Okay. I'll prove it to you. How? You're not well enough to walk? Carry me on a stretcher. I want to prove it. Great John Omar Pinson is dead. 
Tomorrow I'll show you the place I buried him. Eleven a.m. Bennett had no difficulty in taking us right to the spot. He pointed out the remains of the campfire and the old shovel he'd used, and the spot where Pinson was buried. Good with a shovel, eh, copper? <laughs> You'll get blisters. Never thought I'd see the day a cop would dig for pension. <laughs> Why did you lie to me? I didn't lie. I buried him there. I dug the hole myself, put him in myself, put the rock on him. Well, certainly nobody would steal him. I tell you, I buried him there, right there. I swear it on my dying word, I swear it. Somebody was in there. John Omar Pinson died. I buried him right there. In my 20 years of police work, it's the strangest thing I ever saw. I don't care what Bennett said. I don't care what the papers or anybody else said. I don't care if he was buried. John Omar Pinson's not dead. Can it? That's all I hear all day long. Get wise, kid. Bennett buried him. He was just setting up an alibi for Pinson. I'll take two. He wouldn't lie if he knew he was cashing in. You, Louie, you know how clever he is. He can do anything. He can't fly backwards through the pearly gates. I'll call you a bet and raise you the Empire State Building. You, Louie, you worked with him. I'll call you with a Golden Gate Bridge. Listen, you guys. You've been saying you got a couple of machine guns hid outside. You tell me where they are, and I'll promise to find Benson. What do you got? And we'll both come back here and crash out. Three deuces. Bob tail straight. Well, what do you know? I don't own the Empire State Building no more. <laughs> <laughs> the taxes will kill you. But what about it? Yeah, it's your Are you deal. guys going to tell me where they're hid? We'll think about it. Yeah, Warden. I think it can be done. In fact, the matter, I've got a man in mind for the job right now. Oh, uh, Fuller just came in. No, no, he doesn't know about the surprise. I'll fill him in. Goodbye. What's the surprise? Well, Colin, by the name of Wayne Long, gets out next week. Oh, yeah, he's the one that sipped that Pinson's still alive. Mm -hmm. I've heard that one. Grapevine has it that a couple of cons by the name of Louis Fett and Mike Denneke have stashed two machine guns on the outside. Heard that one, too. Mm -hmm. You're a hard man, Fuller. Oh, it's duck soup. Long tells Fett and Denneke he'll find Pinson and spring them if they'll tell him where to find the guns. We tail him. When he picks up the guns, nothing to it. But you made one mistake. I believe Pinson's alive, too. Oh, uh -huh. And you're nuttier than Wayne Long. We saw the grave. But there was no body in it. Here. 
try this on for size. Oh, on you it looks good. Are you kidding? Since Bennett died, Long hasn't had a cellmate. Until now. Oh, now look, Lieutenant. These guys are locked from here to Timbuktu. Mm -hmm. If they get onto me, I'll be full of more knives than a, than a, than a porcupine. Right. Surprise? Yeah. <laughs> I don't like it. It's kind of a surprise to kill you. Listen, you guys. You gotta tell me tonight. Tomorrow's too late. Tell me where they are and Pinson and I'll get you out. What about it, Louie? Might as well. By the time we get out of here, they'll be too old for us to use. You guys are all nuts. Pinson's been dead for months. That's a lie. Pinson's the smartest man that ever lived. He fooled him. You got proof? No, but I will have it. These guys will tell me where they stashed those machine guns. Button up your left, kid. If you get killed, it's because you talk too much. After breakfast in the exercise yard. Jim. <laughs> January 19, Wayne Long received a new suit, new shoes, and the usual $10. Louis Fett and Mike Dennegy had given the information to Long. Detective Fuller reported back to me saying that he'd been unable to overhear their conversation. Long was undecided whether to take a bus or a cab. It would have made no difference. The detective was on the bus, another was driving the cab, and several others in cars were standing by. What happened? Grab the cab, get rolling while I flash headquarters. Unit 12 to W2680. Unit 12 to W2680. Unit 12 to W2680. Suspect is moving toward business district in taxi cab, license number 935-204. Unit 12 following, others drop behind. Unit 12 out. Unit 12 to W2680. Suspect has just entered a residence at 1349 Garvey. Have Unit 3 stand by north of the dead end. Unit 12 out. Well, it looks like we will wait. Yeah. Anything in that paper he bought? I doubt it, but we'll check the personals. Suspect is leaving residence carrying two packages. Could be machine guns. Have Unit 3 tailing. Fuller and I are going into the house. Unit 12 out. Uh, yes, officers. He said he was Elma Smith. Well, why did he come here? He said he was sent by two men who used to board here. And what were their names? I don't really remember, but they left a trunk here in the basement a few years ago. Said they'd be back for it, but 
They never came. So this man said that they'd sent him to get something from it. Well, how did you know they sent him? Because he said they told him if he called me Aunt Jenny, I'd know he was a friend of theirs. Aunt Jenny? No, that's just it. Nobody calls me Aunt Jenny but those two men who used to live here. Well, how did they happen to? I used to listen to a radio program so much that had an Aunt Jenny in it. So when he called me Aunt Jenny, I knew he knew the other men, so I let him go down to the trunk. Uh-huh. Are these the two boarders that used to live here? Yes. Friends of yours? No, ma'am. Oh. Do you uh, know what he took from the trunk? No, do you? Yes. I'm afraid I do. Oh. Fuller and I had to make a quick decision. Should we pick up Long for violation of parole and possessing illegal firearms, or should we string along and see if he could throw any light on what happened to Pinson or his body? It's a tough decision. with the truck, all right. I wish I dared to pick him up, but if we're gonna solve that Pinson mystery, we've got to play along with him. Put the glasses on him. Right. Try for the plates. Unit 12 to W2680. Stand by. Yeah. Washington plate TA21683. I wonder if he knows that truck driver. was sure that Pinson was alive, and he wanted to attract the attention of the escaped criminal. He knew he'd have to carry out a very definite plan. The whole trouble was, Long was doing his planning with a warped mind. Nine miles southeast of town. The truck's just turned into a side road. Stand by. It looks like a one-way lane. I don't know whether to follow him or not. It's all right, young fella. Perfect. Then I reckon you can pay me. You'll get your pay. Now, looky here, young fella. If you're gonna rob me, you're wasting your time. I'll give you what little like that. I'm not gonna rob you. Get out. You bet, but please put that gun away. You can take the truck. I won't lose much. It's insured. You talk too much. Yes, sir. But you got nothing to fear from me. I know that. I'm gonna kill you. Kill me? You got no call to do that. Why, they'll find out who you are. Then... That's what I want them to do. I want this to hit every front page in the country. But that don't make sense. I'm worried. Maybe we should have followed him. It was a toss-up. Let's give him a couple of more minutes. If you want to throw away your life, that's your business, but why take it out on me? I've got a family. When a certain fellow reads about this, he's going to want me for his partner. That's why your number's up. Now go on, get out. Start walking and don't look back. card for the cops. You know what I figure? What? I think maybe we pulled a boner. That's long, all right. But he's alone in that truck. W-2680 from Unit 12. 
Long just passed us alone. Dispatch the nearest unit to check this side lane. It's about four miles southeast of State Highway 124. Unit 12 out. Right, here you go. And so, Long's plan had been put into action, even though it called for one of the most cold-blooded murders in our records. Now, the young killer was out to commit as many daring crimes as possible, so that Pinson, the man he worshipped, would read about them in the papers and perhaps decide that Long would make a good partner in crime after all. First a truck, now a grocery. Wonder what the man will collect next. Pinson's alive, which I doubt. Long might hold up and try to get word through to the grapevine. When I was in that cell, he boasted he knew how to contact Pinson. Well, if he comes out with a big bag of groceries, we'll know that you're right. to cash a check either. Suspect is now entering a bank at the corner of 5th and Main. Dispatch all available units. Tell them to hold the sirens. We can't risk a gun battle in the bank, so we'll attempt to make the arrest as he leaves the building. Drop it! Back. Has win me. Uh, I always said the next time I'd shoot first and warn him afterwards. But somehow I just can't seem to do it. It's part of being a cop. Wayne Long was rushed to the hospital in critical condition. Late that night, he talked. I worship Pinson. I think he's a mastermind. Greatest criminal that ever lived. I wanted to learn from him so I could pull big jobs. Well, I knew he'd read about me in the papers, about killing that truck driver, pulling that bank job single-handed. But isn't John Omar Pinson dead? Bennett swore with his dying breath he saw him die and buried him. Fuller and I saw the grave. But his body wasn't there. No, but somebody had been in that grave. And remember, Bennett was Maybe dying. Bennett believed he was dead. I don't. Pinson's too smart to die. He's alive. And he's making you cops look sick. The kid's nuts. Pinson's dead. There's only one way to find out. This is all a very dramatic story. So we'll give it to the newspapers. I've talked too much. Yeah. Just like Mike Denicky said you would. Stupid punk, I was dead till he started shooting his mouth off. Now I've got 600 years hanging over me and millions of people looking for me. I've got to get out of the country. But first, I'll have to have an identity. I've got to be somebody to get a passport. How do you start to be somebody when you're dead? February 28th, 7.30 a.m., the first step toward a new identity. Your name, Petey? A friend of mine tells me you write a beautiful hand. He got a name? 
Said I wouldn't have to mention his name. If I showed you this. Why don't you write your own letters, friend? I injured my fingers. So I noticed. You got a mate to what you showed me? Anything that large seldom has a mate. It would take that much to limber my fingers. Would it keep them that way? Another G on delivery. Too steep. Play a game of pool? All right, you win. Got a pencil and paper? Oh, no. I never write anything down. Just give me the dope. I won't forget it. If you cross me, I swear. The cops that keep you so busy, I wouldn't have to worry. Height. Five eleven. Wait. One seven five. Eyes brown, hair dark, complexion dusky. Residence. Fourteen seventy two Morningside Drive. Occupation. Biologist. What name do you want me to put on? John Omar Pinson. Go ahead, Pinson. I wish you would try it. Foxy Walsh. How did you know I was here? The police been watching this place and a hundred more just like it. Ever since your story broke in the newspaper. All right. Over against the wall. Both of you boys know the routine. Of all the dumb luck. had all the dumb luck. It's like hitting that eight ball. Okay, call it luck. But remember, you're both racked up in the corner pocket. Our local police force, the reporters outside, and the public were all waiting to hear the solution of Pinson's death and burial. At first, he wouldn't answer. But at 11.10 that night... All right. All right, I'll tell you. I was pretty badly shot up during the prison break. It took Bennett and me three days to reach the Columbia River. <laughs> I was bleeding all the way. After they finally crossed the river and made camp, I began to feel like I was dying. I made Bennett promise to bury me there. After that, I don't remember. What's the first thing that you do remember? Blacker than any night. So black, I couldn't see a thing. I'm dead. I'm dead. No. No, I'm breathing. I can't be dead. Why can't I get up? Why can't I move? It's cold. It's so cold. What's the matter? I was buried. Sure. Sure, Ben must have buried me. Thought I was dead. I'm gonna get up. This is wonderful. Now I'm in danger. Nobody knows I'm alive. Nobody will look for me. Okay, suckers. Here lies John Omar Pinson, public enemy number four. <laughs> That's just what happened, gentlemen. That's the whole story. In 20 years of police work, that beats them all. For John Omar Pinson, the sentence was life. Life in the Oregon State Prison, the place from which he made such daring escapes. For Wayne Long, the sentence was not life, but...
Henson had run out of plans. Long was running out of time. As the young man set out to take his last walk, Wayne Long had wanted to travel fast to catch up with Pinson. He was moving slowly, on weak legs now. He had really always been too weak to carry his own weight alone. pellets were released, Wayne Long's ambition to be like his unwisely chosen idol came to an end. And some punks never learn.